are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Tuesday as usual, and uh, Gil and Dr. K here bringing you your uh, Tuesday afternoon live webinar on the market. I'm sure everybody had a chance, or I hope everybody had a chance to check out uh, my GoView uh, pre-market comments yesterday morning because I think they were pretty relevant in light of what we've seen yesterday and today uh, pretty much uh, on track in terms of letting you know that we you know we came down it actually came down one two three four five six seven eight nine days uh, in a row you had one update here on the NASDAQ and we bounced off the 200 day moving average now that's textbook I mean that, that's so obvious uh, anybody could see that that you have the potential to uh, bounce off the 200 day particularly when you've been down uh, eight, eight nine days in a row or eight out of nine days in a row and uh, looking pretty ugly. Actually, that would be seven out of nine. This day was up, but we opened higher than we closed. So uh, once we came down, we came down a straight line. So now we're bouncing. So you notice how uh, everything is just coming up off the lows, and some of the bounces are violent. So if you're if you were short and you're making some money here, uh, this is where you want to start to think about covering. Yeah, we could break the 200-day, or we could have yesterday maybe undercut this low, this 2603 low. Uh, but for now, everything seems to make sense in terms of coming down hard, testing the 200-day we held yesterday. Volume was not particularly heavy, and now you're bouncing. So really what you're doing here is just kind of watching and see how things pan out. We're, we're two days. And Dr. K, what would you say, one day of a rally attempt so far just today, right? Yes, yeah, just today. Uh, yesterday, well, that, that could be argued, actually. Yesterday was a mid-bar close. Uh, and so it could be argued that today is the second route day of the rally attempt. Textbook-wise, today is the first day. Okay, I got you then. So uh, yeah, so you call it first day or second day, however you want to you want to mark it. But that's all you're doing right now. You're just bouncing. So you're just watching to see what happens. Uh, I think the key thing here to keep an eye on is the dollar, which you know has been down. Let's take a look at the UUP, uh, and the dollar has been been uh, down the last couple of days. I noticed you had a, a higher low. I pointed this out yesterday morning. You have a higher low here, so you know you get back above the 50-day uh, and the 65-day exponential, then you break down back below. Now you rally back up into the 50-day moving average. That's your blue moving average here. It's kind of running along with the green one, which is the 20-day. But you back down a little bit. The UUP is not showing a lot of uh, volume on the downside here as it pulls back. So you kind of got to keep an eye on this. If the dollar uh, picks up its rally again, that could send the market lower again. It could also send precious metals down. Uh, if you've been watching precious metals, gold is still holding the 50-day moving average. So we actually have a small position in the DGP based on the pocket pivot of May 20th. Okay, And of course, we came into that pocket pivot with the idea that it would hold the 50-day moving average and that we would be using the 50-day moving average as our guide for a downside stop. Uh, I was on Fox Friday afternoon and they asked me what I liked and really I didn't like anything uh, but I mentioned that if the market does continue to go lower and if the indexes do break the 200-day moving averages after this bounce, so assuming this bounce fails, it's possible that a really really weak market and a further break you know, down 15% on the indexes, it could start to weigh on precious metals uh, as I said on Monday morning, institutions are up to their eyeballs in commodities and probably precious metals as well in the GLD and the SLV. So, you know, the potential for them uh, to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to pull back and test previous lows, I think, is definitely there. Um, everybody can see my screen okay, right? I just want to make sure. I'm going to type in. Yes, they can. There's somebody who still sees the welcome screen. We just saved that for you. Um, no, that's not true. I'm not quite sure what causes that. If there are glitches, usually it's on your end. Could be a bandwidth issue. Could be a flash issue. Could be any number of minor uh, settings on your end. But for the most part, when you have 99.9% .9 of everybody being able to see everything, there's not much we can do on our end. Uh, to solve any of those problems, unfortunately. But we are, as always, recording this, so it will be available to view uh, in a less bandwidth-intensive environment, hopefully. 
Uh, but in any case, you see the GLD, you're forming this cup with him, you're pulling back, you're still holding the 50-day moving average. So even though I went on TV and I said, yeah, you could see uh, if gold pulled back and you saw gold down at 1450, to me, that would be the ultimate low and big area of support. I'd look for that to hold. And that would actually take you down here to 140, just about a little bit more on the GLD. Okay, so, I mean, that would be an extreme low. And if the market got very weak, the potential is that you could drag the precious metals. But for now, you just go by what they're doing. And gold is the, the metal of choice right now simply because the silver isn't really giving us anything to track on. Something to notice, remember I talked about uh, you had a pocket pivot here in the GLD, and then you have the 10-day right here crossing above the 20-day. Notice that's holding on the GLD, but look at the SLB. Um, the 10-day is now crossing below or starting to cross below the 20-day, so it's obviously weaker. It's obviously got more technical damage to work off. Potentially, if the market dragged it down or if it dragged itself down, it could undercut these lows. And I'd look for a bounce off the 200-day moving average just above 30. And notice that this also coincides with this area where you broke out uh, back in February. You broke out from this consolidation, so you would come right back on top if that were to occur. Otherwise, you have undercut this low, tried to hold the day, not really getting a lot of momentum. If silver has uh, has some work to do, whereas gold looks a little bit better. Dr. K, what's your preference here? Uh, well, I've always said <clears throat> that uh, you know gold, if it's going to do well, it's going to drag up silver, and silver is going to outperform gold on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, right. So I'm watching gold, and I love the way it's tracing out right now. <clears throat> May and June tend to be months where the demand for gold is is pretty lackluster. So. What we're seeing is pretty textbook. Um, we did see a, a minor rally in gold in May, but now we're seeing it backtrack a bit. So this is playing out according to history. And I would expect, if history plays out, uh, that gold will continue to base until the end of June, and maybe we'll see a breakout in July or August. Yeah, so for now, you know, we have a small position, a 10% position in the DGP, which is being, you know, it's 20% long gold on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, and so we're just hanging out with it. It's really not, you know, we went hog wild when I think, did we go on marching with the AGQ back in uh, April, May? I think we did. Yeah, we did. We, we went on, I mean, we kept pyramiding the position, and I think we got up to about, probably about 120 or 130 percent long a a G AGQ. Yeah. yeah, and so that was a nice uh, move to play in silver back then. Uh, Dr. K, that's your mother on the phone. Do you need to get it? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It, it, it never fails. Whenever uh, we start <laughs> these broadcasts, that's when everyone wants to call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so anyways, that, that's what's going on with the GLD. Maybe you buy some in here. and Maybe if it holds, you know, you have a near reference as far as the stop goes. Uh, we still tend to think that the long-term trajectory for the do dollar is lower. Uh, in the meantime, though, you could be getting a fear bid coming uh, from the fact that Greece is continually getting downgraded and there's going to be some money uh, printing over in Europe, so maybe there's a safety trade into the dollar. Uh, we've also noticed that uh, you know bonds have been acting well, but today they gapped down pretty hard. That's interesting to note. So interest rates, are interest rates headed higher? If interest rates are headed higher, that's going to be positive for the dollar and that could drag down the market in precious metals. So the only thing you can do is watch what these things are doing. So our metal of choice is GLD uh, and the SLV you can try and play, but I think I'd wait for some sort of a buy signal uh, to show up, something bona fide in terms of either a pocket pivot coming up through here or up to the 50-day, and that may take some time. But if there's going to be a big move in silver, it's going to go much higher. So I think you have time to wait. It would have been nice if this had worked and if we had gotten a pocket pivot through here, but we didn't. And so you just go with what is happening uh, with the SLV itself. And in the meantime, we can uh, utilize very simple reference points for the GLD, and that's kind of where we're going to stay for now. So I still am watching silver as a fast trade since I love those fast trades, those fast-moving trades like the AGQ was back in April, May. Uh, and I think uh, you know you may see that eventually, but for now that's really what you're looking at. So you want to keep an eye on the dollar. If we get a pullback in the dollar, uh, that's uh, whoops, that's not the dollar. That's that's the 20-year bond ETF. If the dollar rallies again, you might see another pullback in the market. But we'll we'll see what happens here. But for now, you know we just know that you're coming up off the 200-day uh, moving average on the Nasdaq. This is the S&P. Now note that the S&P. Uh, here's this little downtrend channel that we were in. 
it broke down below. It did not get to the 200-day moving average. So it actually held well above. So maybe it's going to rally into this downtrend line. Maybe this is resistance. I just watch and see how this plays out. Uh, I think right now, if you made money on the short side on the break over the last nine days, then it's too too late to be trying to short too heavily here. I'm trying to test some positions, and my general rule is if the market's rallying and I want to short into the, the high end of a rally, uh, if, if I'm not making money by the end of the year, I just flatten out and come back and think about it the next day and rethink. So, you know, Apple was a decent trade off the from here down to here, hit the 200-day moving average. You know, that's all that's textbook. So, could have taken a quick trade. Now it's rallying back up into this area. And this could be uh, resistance. I'd watch the 20-day moving average here uh, at 336 for a potential area of, of resistance. The other thing is it could rally all the way back up to the 50-day moving average. You're kind of watching it. Volume picked up today, and you gapped up. So this thing is in uh, reflex mode, reflex rally mode, dead cap bounce mode, whatever you want to call it. And most stocks were. So you know, we also looked at Under Armour. And a lot of times I like coming after stocks when they're doing this, uh, for example, look at Finisar. You know, as it's coming up, it's starting to look pretty decent, uh, rallying up in here, and you have some nice volume coming in here. But these are actually short sale points on the peak of the right shoulder. Uh, UA, it looked like you know it's coming up into an area of potential resistance, and it's gotten above. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, I should actually change my charts here. Let's go to. Uh, this and you can see the volume. But one thing to note here is see the volume signatures. These are pocket pivot volume signatures. Uh, the, the stock did get a recommendation yesterday from Stern AG, which I think is just a kind of a cheesy retail shop. But you know that's just me. I hope there's nobody from Stern AG out there who's offended. But <laughs> but I think uh, you know they're putting a buy recommendation on the stock. It comes down to this level. It's rallying. This could roll over. I just watch for it to roll over. But the thing here is I'm not going to stay short this today if I put some out number one because I'm not up on the position so I'm not making any money I'm not going to come in here and try and sit short and have a rally just keep squeezing me I'll come in test the rally if it doesn't work back away and come back tomorrow or maybe it, it doesn't happen until Thursday or maybe Friday who knows or maybe you get a follow through day and the market continues higher so um, Everybody wants to know how we pyramided AGQ, but you know, there's nothing rocket science on that, people. You buy the breakout, and then you pick a percentage up, 10% more, 10% uh, up, you, know, you, you add to it again, another 10% you add to it, and you just do it that way. There's no magic way to pyramid. You just pyramid a position that's working. Right, Dr. K? Uh, yeah, in the case of AGQ, since it's commodities driven and uh, some of these commodities don't won't have the kind of uh, uh, telltale signature buy points that stocks have, uh, sometimes it's best to just allocate um, additional positions as the price proves itself. So in other words, you set a certain percentage that says, based on the volatility uh, and price momentum of AGQ, um, if it goes up by X percent, you're going to add X per Y percent to your position. And that's what we did with this one. Right. So every 10% it went up, we added a certain percentage to the position. And what happened is that uh, specifically here. We, we added 20%. Uh, well, we added, we added the same number of shares every time it, it went up 10%. Right. And that 10% number was based on the volatility and price momentum of the stock. 10% uh, sound, right. sounds like ETF. Canned. Right. Um, it sounds pretty canned, but there are slower names where uh, the, pre the percentages would be different. Right. Most people would like to think that, oh, we bought here, and then it pulled back and we added here, and then it pulled back and we added here. No, really what happens is we bought here, it proved itself here, we added more, it proved itself again, we added more. So we're ac actually averaging up, and that's a pretty standard way uh, to pyramid. And if something's going to work for you very nicely, and we knew AGQ on the upside would have a lot of volatility uh, on the upside if it was going to move, uh, so we thought that would work pretty well. And uh, it was pretty much textbook. It wasn't nothing really fancy on it. So... Uh, but getting back to the shorts, uh, and everything's bouncing. UA, I, as I said, you had three pocket pivots in here. You got one here, one here, one here. Now, this one got above this 50-day. Would you actually buy that, Dr. K, on the long side? No, no, not at all. Uh, no. I don't like the gap down that occurred uh, just, just a few Over weeks here. ago. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also, 
this this market environment is very challenging. So if I'm going to buy anything on the long side, it, it better measure up. It better tick all the boxes. And and yeah. certainly any any reports that we send out are stocks that tick all the boxes. And I think people will notice that we haven't been sending too many reports out on the long side. Uh, in fact, virtually none, I think. Today, however, though, we did pick up two uh, pocket pivots. In Biogen, you had a pocket pivot. You see that coming up off the 50-day moving average. You know, this is a huge gap up, builds this flag, just drifts down, drifts down. Now, boom, you're coming up. So that might be viable using uh, 9151 as maybe a rough guide for your stop. And then the other one is a Cephade, uh, which is actually a pocket pivot and a flag breakout today. So, you know, those are two stocks I suppose you could look at here if you wanted to get long or you need to get long or the market follows through or something like that. Um, they, the other they're, thing, also, they're also uh, bio, well, they're medical uh, biotech related companies and right. uh, these types of companies can sometimes, or more, more often, if, if an industry group is going to buck a general market downtrend, it's going to be these types of groups. Yeah, and just keep in mind, if you're in a market correction, the your risk is uh, increased, so you want to size your positions accordingly if you decide to go long. For our money, we're not doing anything on the long side. We're just kind of hanging out and waiting, although we do point out or, or look for areas of strength that we might want to go into if the market starts to right itself and go higher. But at best, it seems like you're in a very choppy and very sloppy environment as we approach the end of QE2. And the potential for some mute form, some mutation of QE2 coming out in the form of QE3 or son of QE2 or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> but I would say that in general, you know, the, the long side is pretty muted at this point. You don't want to be stepping in now. It, that that now, I, you know, you, you ask, uh, do we start shorting? The time to be shorting was when we were talking about some of these setups uh, a couple of weeks ago. Finisar is down there; it's gapped down. Earnings come out tomorrow, I believe, the 15th of June. So, you know, that's had its move. That thing's down a good 20, 30 percent uh, off the right shoulder when we first mentioned it, I think, right about here. So it was shortable in here right under the 50-day, I'm sorry, the 200-day moving average. And uh, I believe also that was a 50-day, the two of them. But notice now the 50-day crossed below right there, and at that point that's where the stock uh, broke down. So that one's worked out pretty well. Las Vegas Sands is still in play, uh, mainly because you haven't seen it break down, but we watch it come along here, and we talked about it back in here as it was fluttering along the 200-day moving average, and you rally back into it, you hold for a little while, now you're breaking down. Now you're coming back into the 40 level, which might be resistance. But right now, the only shorts we've been looking at has been Las Vegas Sands, which has come down a little bit, Finisar, which has come down a fair bit, Apple, which gave you a quick trade, but really percentage-wise, even with today's move, five, six points, it's only a little over uh, one and a half percent, I believe, so it's pretty uh, pretty minimal, 1.79 percent on Apple. So you, so you remember that three points, 3.3 points is one uh, percent on this stock, so we don't get carried away with points. So really, that's kind of a feeble bounce, and maybe it bounces a little further tomorrow. But I do think if you're shorting here, you know, this is your logical area to take profits right at the 200 day. You could have hovered there for a little bit to see if it breaks the 200 day. Uh, but I think there's potential for Apple to go down. Uh, you know, the company just uh, announced that they're building what I refer to as the Lord of the Ring office building. I, I think everybody's seen uh, the uh, pictures of that and it just looks like this massive silver ring. Uh, but there's sort of a history of companies getting uh, into grandiose projects or grandiose uh, mergers. You can think of AOL buying Time Warner back in the early 2000s, and that signaled the top for good in AOL. Uh, there was Pan Am back in the 60s. They built a Pan American building in New York City. It was built in 1963, and at the time it was the world's uh, largest commercial building, and uh, so there's a lot of fans for And then I believe it's Bill O'Neill used to tell me that stock topped right around then, uh, and that was it for Pan Am stock. So uh, maybe that's what's going on with Apple. But the one thing I do know is stocks trading at 13 times forward estimates. We don't view PE ratios as a measure of absolute value. The market knows what the PE ratio of any stock is, and what the PE ratio really tells you is what sort of value the market places on the forward earnings stream of any particular stock. So what I want to know is why at 13 times estimates, why does the market value uh, Apple's future earnings stream so so badly? Uh, is it 
looking at the potential for Steve Jobs to some, some, uh, somehow be out of the picture. Uh, and I'm just being realistic from an investor's point of view. Uh, obviously, we would wish the best for Steve Jobs, but you know, what is the, what is the market seeing here, and what re would resolve it? Steve Jobs being cured—if that's the case, then uh, that may never happen. Or if you're just in this limbo phase forever, maybe it goes sideways forever. But I definitely would watch this. I think if you break the 200 day in Apple, that's probably going to be a harbinger of lower lows to come. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Dr. K. What would it take to get your model out of cash, uh, out of its cash signal into a sell signal at this point? Well, um, I'll start with the buy signal. Uh, what I'd like to see is a rounding out of the leadership, um, and for a firming up of leading stocks, and a, not necessarily a, a classic follow through day where the major averages meet the threshold level. What I'd like to see, the model's looking for basically a rounding out, a firming up of leadership. Uh, in other words, leadership that is not in a downtrend and is looking to, to move higher. Um, so it's watching carefully for that because of the levels that the market's at right now. We're oversold and QE is still in play and we could certainly find a bottom here. Now on the other, on the other hand, we have a sell signal we're looking for as well because a bounce that we experience right now might be anemic. Uh, and also the fact that the market came off as hard as it did uh, with QE2 in effect tells me that there's been a material change in the way, uh, in the responsiveness of the market to uh, QE2. So perhaps uh, we, what the bounce that we see is going to be uh, a bit disappointing, in which case the, mo the model will be looking also for selling pressure, renewed selling pressure uh, after the bounce, and that could push that uh, the model into a sell signal. Of course, okay. it's going to look at major averages and leading stocks and how they sh the price volume shapes up. Okay, fair enough. So, so we're in the middle right now. Right now, we're you know right in the middle, midpoint, or call it purgatory. Uh, we no don't man's know land. No Evan man's or land. Hell. That's what I like to call it. <laughs> so you, you're in no man's land, as I like to refer to it. I mean, you come down hard. Now you're in bounce mode. So what are you looking at? Uh, you know, so people are ask about stocks and I think it's pretty academic uh, you know what you're seeing the fertilizers CF trying to break out you had a pocket pivot here remember this uh, I think we pointed that out or, but, but we're not so sure that it's something we'd necessarily buy into you could buy CF the other ags are not necessarily confirming potash is hanging out below its 50-day moving average I've been looking at AGU as uh, potentially shortable in here uh, you're seeing the 50-day now starting to come down towards the 200-day moving average. So, uh, and again, weak volume rally right into the 50-day. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, FCX when it did that in here. And maybe now uh, AGU does something like that. Uh, the, other, the other one's Mosaic in a weak position here. So it looks kind of kind of garbagey there. Uh, Monsanto is another ag stock. And it's holding above its 50-day moving average, so it's acting a little better. So the only one you have acting well is CF. So the group in general is pretty, pretty poor. Uh, but we do, you know, medicals looking okay, and you have had uh, some of the better stocks have been some of the health service stocks and biotechs like Biogen and Cephate also acting pretty well. Um, some of the other biotechs, you know, VRUS. Here's a big breakout here, and it's holding up. Uh, you know, maybe that's that looks okay. That's farm asset. Uh, looking at ZAGG, I don't think that is that a is that a biotech? I don't think so. Consumer products. I don't know that that's a cheap stock. I don't really think I'd be into it. I'm acquiring uh, another cheap stock, two hundred twelve thousand. I don't know. Those are just gapping up and moving out. Thin stocks. Not really much to think about those. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to go through some of my uh, lists here. Baidu is coming off the lows here, all the way down to the 200-day moving average. Another logical bounce zone. I'd watch for it coming up in either 129 or one up towards 137. Maybe this is building a base, but for now it doesn't look so hot. And when you're looking at some of the other Chinese internets like Xena, uh, which is getting clocked. Let's take a look at this on a weekly chart. 
you know, now this is starting to look like a big ugly head because you have this huge volume break here. So this is looking like the right side of the head, but you know, you don't want to, maybe it forms a, an ascending neckline. That's generally not as weak as a pattern where you have the right shoulder below the left shoulder. I guess this would be your left shoulder. Here's a head, maybe you form a right shoulder. But I do remember uh, stocks breaking down from patterns like that. In fact, I remember FCX back in 2008 uh, forming this ascending. You see, here's your left shoulder, here's your head, here's your right shoulder. It actually had a decent break. I mean, you could have shorted this and made a good 30% uh, profit pretty quickly here uh, on this break. So you do see you have an ascending, uh, ascending neckline here. Let me see if I can draw it out for you so you can see what's going on. Uh, but this here's your ascending neckline here, and you do see that you break down here. So it is shortable, but notice how it goes to highs one more time. It looks like it's going to break out, and then it fails, and kaboom. And this actually ends up being some sort of ugly uh, late stage kind of pod formation, but not, you know, because you do have a steep uh, break down here for the low, and this is a sharp move back to the upside where it pretty much doubles uh, over about five months or so. So it's a pretty quick move, and then it just blows to pieces with everything else. But my point simply is in the sending neckline, sometimes it can be shortable. So, um, <clears throat> so when you're looking at Cena, I gotta get rid of this pen. <clears throat> you could get a right shoulder here and then it breaks down, it has a nice breakdown into here or something and you, you can score some quick profits on it. So it could work, but you know, generally what we like to see is this pattern. This is your your model uh, where you have left shoulder here, you have your big head, and uh, this is well below uh, the left shoulder. The right shoulder forms well below the left shoulder. And that's pretty much the model that we use and it's based on the old uh, Crocs model, which also looks like uh, certainty back in the 60s. Uh, I remember that was one of the first charts Bill O'Neill show, showed me when he was showing me what you're looking for when you're looking for head and shoulders formation. So, you know, that's what we're looking for now. Um, and there, there's not a huge amount of them uh, out there yet, but you know, that, that situation will continue to develop over time. So for the most part, uh, we have our targets. We're going to be very selective about them. Uh, and we'll put them out when we think that they're in a good position. But as I said, today, you know, with UA, you got these pocket pivots, probably, you, you just kind of watch this. This could fail, and that's what I'd be watching for. But I'm not going to stay in the stock short uh, if it's not working for me right away. I'll just come in. If you're going to short into rallies, you kind of have to come in, back away, come in, back away until you finally get it working for you. Then you can start to build as it rolls, and hopefully you get some kind of a major breakdown. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. But I think for now, we're looking at a 69.82 stop on the position. Ultimately, that's only about a percent and a half from where we first talked about it, right under the 69 level. So I don't even think it's that much. So it's, it's a really tiny stop. So there's, there is really a short leash that you can have this one on. And if you're just testing it, it might roll over. <clears throat> Another pattern I've been looking at, keeping an eye on, is uh, Jazz, which was a great performer on the way up. But if you're looking at it here, I don't, I don't know, it's starting to look like a Either it's building a base or it's starting to look like a head and a shoulder here, but I, we'll see how that goes. But it's been, uh, it is in the biotech area, so it could try and come out of here. But I noticed this thing has broken down and has been able to unable to rally back above its 50-day uh, moving average. So I'm kind of watching this. Anything that breaks down hard, it goes on my short sale list, and I'll just keep an eye on it to uh, see how it pans out over time. So we don't seem to have a lot of questions. Uh, as far as individual names go, that's probably because everybody knows everything sucks. So it's not like there's a lot of things to be buying. There are some things acting okay, as we pointed out. The Cephade uh, Biogen is an interesting uh, pocket pivot here, but not necessarily sure it's going to uh, take off. But let's just go through some of the uh, big names here. So Amazon has pulled back down. Really, though, the way I look at this one, you have a trend line breakout here. So here's your breakout here, boom, you go up through this line, and now you pulled back on top of it. So it's really still potentially in basing mode. It is, however, underneath its 50-day moving average, which is interesting. Uh, and if you ask me, is this a short or a buy, I really couldn't tell you. I just kind of watch and see how it acts. Maybe you get some kind of a pocket pivot here up to the 50-day moving average, and you can be back in there buying it. But I think that uh, the, the, the jury's still out on something like this. But it did hold 
the trend line breakout. So it looks like it's trying to hang in there. So we did point out Baidu, you know, comes all the way down into this structure here. Basically on top of this prior breakout, which was this gap out that it tested, or gap up move that was viable, and then it retested, held the lows on a closing basis, held the low of the gap up, see that? So you held it here, and then you turn around and you move higher. Now you're just pulling back down on the 200 day moving average. Maybe you're in the process of building a base. Uh, maybe you're in the process of just breaking down in general. So, you know, on the weekly chart, that's what body looks like. Does that look like a head and shoulders? I don't see a left shoulder. Again, here, this would be your left shoulder. This might be your head, but you don't really see a major volume breakdown to tell you that uh, it's really the optimal sort of pattern. So that's kind of what you want to see. And there's been some that have worked pretty well. Travel zoo uh, was a, sort of a narrow. There's like a left shoulder here and this pin head and a right shoulder. That's a real narrow pattern. And uh, in volatile stocks, you might see that. But you had a climax top and then another climax top. We call this the porn star stock, uh, double climax. I won't go any, into it any further than that. Uh, but, you know, this thing broke down pretty good. Now it looks like it needs to rally. So that was another one that I've been looking at. We didn't mention it on the site. Uh, but just some stocks I've been keeping track of. Uh, with the idea that um, some of these could eventually go lower if we went into a protracted bear market. For now, we're not really there yet. You're off about, uh, what are we off on the indexes, Dr. K? I think it's about 7% on the NASDAQ and like 6 on the S&P. Is that yeah, correct? After today's rally, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, so you know, you're looking at uh, short-term correction land, basically. And that may be where you're at. So, and again, we just may be in a very choppy and very sloppy market, continuing for some time. So, you know, maybe maybe a good summer for vacationing. Um, but I think right now, with the model in a neutral signal, you know, you're, you're playing capital preservation. So just hang out. Uh, it, certainly, if you're not going to play the short side, then you're obviously going to stay in cash because there's nothing to buy. Uh, but if you want to play the short side, you know, maybe think twice. It's not as easy as it looks sometimes, and a lot of it is uh, looks nicer in hindsight more than anything. Is it time for you to get up now, Dr. K? First, I hear your phone. Now I hear your alarm going off. That that is all part part of the uh, iPhone four <laughs> based okay. on the sound effects I've chosen. I thought you were trying to be Jim Cramer with a bunch of sound effects. Um, oh, is that what he's doing? I never, I never watch his show. So, I, in fact, I don't. I just don't watch television. So, I, I, I'm clueless when it comes to CNBC or Fox or, or anything, except except the links that I get from uh, from Darlene. You know, I obviously uh, like to see you on, uh, on the right. show. Cause you've got a, a element of grace and sophistication to these networks. But other than right. that, I really uh, am clueless about the, the what they broadcast. <laughs> Thought, uh, somebody's asking thoughts on A and B. Uh, I don't know. It looks like a dog. I don't like miners. Miners are dogs. I mean, just go through all of them. C D E dog. P A S dog. Uh, what are some of the gold miners? G G. Gold Corp dog. You know, all these are down to the 200-day moving average. They're going to try and bounce. Maybe. Am I going to buy them? No. I'd rather just stay with G L D. A lot more coherent. And the miners are just all over the place. So kind of doggy. Uh, so those are my thoughts, such as uh, they are. So yeah, somebody asked, if the market breaks down, how hard, how would you add to short positions? Uh, if the market breaks down, well, really, what I'm looking at here, I'm not adding to short positions. They're all covered. You know, the indexes, uh, generally, my method for shorting follows the indexes, and I talk about this in our book. Uh, and that is, you know, if you're going to short, you can try and short the bounces, but if they're going to keep going and it keeps bouncing, you just got have to cover. But, you know, if you got short up in here and these things break down, now you see the index is coming down in here. This is a place to start thinking about covering. And if you were short, you know, stock like Apple off the 340 level or thereabouts, you come down 200-day moving average and you're covering. If you were short, for example, say a stock like Cena, you know, on this sort of late-stage reversal uh, off the of this breakout of temper, whatever you want to call it, the right side of this ugly pattern, and you break down into this base and you're down near the 200 day, but also the, the market itself is, uh, let me see, where are we here? The market itself is, is breaking down, so, and, and coming to a position. So when it's, you know, when it all coincides, you see your stocks breaking down and they get to the 200 day moving average or to a logical uh, position of support uh, you take your profits and you back off and you wait for the next run. So the way I do it, I'll, I'll come in short, hopefully you get a break, 
cover at a logical place and then look for a bounce to come in short. I don't build short positions. I take a position pretty close to where I want to uh, to short it, you know, maybe within a buck or two, and I'm adding and building a position as it's in a zone, say, for example. I mean, let's just use that as an example. Finisar, if you're shorting, you know, as it's coming into the 50-day moving average, I might be putting out a position in here. Um, you know, one that I played recently was Aruba Network, so it's bouncing up into this uh, zone of resistance. You know, you have these lows here, so this is looking like an area of potential resistance. And so I'm just kind of shorting it in here, and then it breaks, hits the 200-day, it covers, and of course, always just to piss you off, it goes below the 200-day for one day uh, if you covered at the 200-day. But you know, that, those are your objectives uh, on the trades. And so what I do is I'll just short a position here. If it breaks here, I'll cover. Uh, and then look for some sort of a bounce to reshort in. So we don't really add to positions uh, when we're uh, shorting. So I and I don't. That's not Dr. K. You don't, you've never really shorted, so you don't really get into any of that, right? Well, I've shorted before. Actually, quite uh, my first shorting uh, expedition was back in the '90s, and you know I, I tried here and there, and I've learned a lot more about shorting stocks since then. And I will take short positions on uh, what I talk about in our book um, on on the, those uh, rocket stocks, right? Uh, where the odds are so overwhelmingly in your favor. Um, that, but unfortunately, that kind of setup only occurs maybe once a year. Maybe. Right. So you will add, but for the most part, the way I do it here, you're just trying to get a position in, in the right spot and then let it ride and decide how you're going to uh, you know, portion your positions, 10% positions, 5% positions, 20% positions. Um, and that is exactly how I played the short position or the short side of the market back in uh, May 2010. And I'll show you some of the stocks that I did it with. Uh, whoops, let's see. Let's go. Got to use the right chart here. I played. I basically played three stocks back then: uh, Freeport MacMoran and uh, U.S. Steel and RIM. And you can see that this, as this started to break down in here, this is where I was putting the stock out as a short, as it's kind of hovering, breaks down through the, uh, to me this is a, like a late stage uh, base failure, so it breaks down through the 50 day and rallies back, so I'm putting, a sh putting shorts out in here, and then as we go into the last uh, week of April and into the first week, this thing just blows apart. And you can see you get enough of a move here, it's like, uh, and you get these rallies that you can, you know, so if this breaks, I cover, add again, it breaks, uh, cover, add again, breaks, and it does that one, two, three waves down, boom, the last wave uh, undercuts these lows way over here, and you're just kind of covering, taking your profits, not being a pig. So that's really how I did it, but I built the positions after it starts to get weak, and then it rallies up into the 50-day moving average, and I know I have a lot of moving averages, so. I do that to keep myself calm because wherever I am, there's always a point of resistance if I'm short, and if I'm long, there's always a, a point of uh, support on a moving average. So uh, it's my security blanket. Lots of moving averages on my chart. It Make, makes your charts feel cozy, and they have lots of places to hold up or find resistance if you're short. <laughs> the other one I uh, I played was X, and you can see it's the same situation. You know, X was already breaking down. Here's a little late stage failure. So here I'm, I'm coming in. And actually, I was messing around with it earlier than that. It was starting to work. And then in here, I remember this day, uh, Goldman came out and put a buy on the stock. And I just came in and shorted the, the you know what out of it. And it just broke very quickly. And you look at that, you know, you get a 15% break. And then it just, for the rest of May, just continued lower. And I think by the time we got to the end of May, I was covering all my shorts down here. Uh, the other one that was real nice back then was RIM. And we'll go back. Uh, where are we here? Yeah, this is RIM. And again, this is a breakout. You see that? And, and here's a late stage failure. So it fails here. And now it's trying to rally. And you see how you get several rallies back above the 50 day? And so I'm shorting it in here and building my position in. And this is how I'll do it. You know, it's up until I got what I want. And then, boom, the whole thing just blows apart in, in a few days. And you get a nice uh, break here. Then uh, cover into this break and then it rallies. Notice how it rallies right into the 200 day, short it again, and boom, it breaks again. And by the time we got to the end of May, basically out of that. But th that's all I really needed. And I'm using a lot of intraday leverage 
uh, being 400% short on some days, especially the flash crash day, which is really a huge day for me uh, in terms of uh, profits for one day. I think it's one of my biggest one day profits uh, since 1999. So, you know, but, it, and I also think, you know, a lot of people, uh, you, you know, in 2009, I had some trouble on the short side. I got whacked around at least 50%. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but I can make it back very quickly, and uh, but you have to be able to do your thing, you know. And so when you're running a fund and you have a bunch of screaming clients who wig out whenever you're up or down 10%, uh, Dr. K, you know what that's like. Uh, it, it just kind of gets in your way, and you can't really do your thing because you know if you go down 30%, 40%, that big deal. You can just come right back and make it up very quickly. So um, I, I never really operate from a position of fear until. I started running uh, a fund and realized that you're not dealing with your own fear, whether you have fear or not. You're dealing with uh, all kinds of other garbage from people who are in the fund, from your partners uh, in the business and whatnot, wondering, you know, what, oh my God, we're down 20%. And then what happens? You just start compounding errors. But I think the lesson for me in May 2010 is that, and this is for everybody out there as well, is that when you run into some problems, you go back and you figure out what you did wrong. And then you try to correct your mistakes and then you go and employ that so getting hammered on the short side in 2009 I was able to take a lot of those lessons and a lot of it I talk about in the book and then apply it in May 2010 and if we get another break in the market maybe I'll have another hundred percent month that would be great but I'm not I'm not counting on it right now but we have had a nice break off the peak so we'll see where we go with that but that's how I played May 2010 uh, for those of you who are asking about it Hmm. Yes, Dr. K uses ETS, right? Is that it? I'm, I'm, some of these questions I'm just going through. Here's one for you, Dr. K. So if you don't short, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say there was um, a question about how you uh, set your price targets for silver and gold using uh, probably point and figure charts. That's probably what they're getting at. Oh, my price. Um, okay, let's see. How do I do that? Uh, well, you just go, go to stockcharts.com. And here's a real easy way to do it. And you pull up uh, point and figure charts and type in GLD when you get the point and figure chart window up. And it actually will give you an upside price target uh, on on the uh, stock or ETF that you're looking at. Let me see if I can pull this up for you guys and just give you a quick uh, look at what they actually do here. I think uh, stockcharts.com is an incredible service for what you pay, 120 bucks a year. And they have great charts, some very simple screens. I've never put together any screens because I have a lot of other systems that uh, allow me to do all kinds of screens. So I've never really had to go there. I'm sure if I had to, I could. But um, let me let me just show you what you do here. This is um, everybody can see this browser. This is uh, the login page for stock charts. So you go here, point and figure charts. You click there, and bingo, there's one of the DAO. So let's just type in the GLB here, okay? And what you can see here is right now bullish price objective 202. And I'm, I'm guessing what that's coming from is one of these thrusts or one of these or, or this one. Because you see this is just broken out. And uh, point and figure charts are great for dealing with commodities, at least for me, okay, the way I deal with things. You know, it gets a lot of the noise out of the way. So you can see that gold is hold, holding up in a... Uh, now, there's no pattern here, but they are. It's holding up in this sort of flag pattern, and, and we're we're looking at this now as the cup with handle on the daily chart, right? But on a point figure, it just looks like a flag, and so there's not a lot of noise. But it, they're probably using either the vertical count or the horizontal count to generate uh, this price target. So I'm going to guess that they. Let's just say if we're doing it from here, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so these are two boxes each, so 12 times 2 is 24. Then you multiply that by 3 to come up with uh, 72, and then you add it to, I believe, 132 or 130, and so you're, that's where they're coming up with 202. Okay, so that's how they're generating that price target. They're using the vertical count, that's what I use, and it's a decent guide. I mean, if you go back and you look at silver uh, based on this thrust here, you're getting a 50. $50.50 price target on SLV, and you got pretty close before you topped out. So now you have a bearish price objective of 19 based on what's going on now. But you can see there's this area of congestion building in the SLV on a point and figure, and uh, that may just turn out to be something that helps launch it back the other way. But right now, they're using 
this vertical count probably to generate uh, the $19 bearish price objective. So that's how I use uh, StockCharts.com. It's pretty simple, but you know these things are not 100% guaranteed. Obviously, SLV never got to $50.50, even though that was the price target I recall that they uh, had on the uh, point figure charts. If you're doing the vertical count, and I, I usually just do the vertical count. Uh, myself just to confirm what they're coming up with here but that's a simple way to do it but what it does is it just gives you an idea of what's possible and price targets really are just about what's possible they're not always going to be 100% uh, accurate so um, so Dr. K you will you don't short but you will uh, buy inverse ETFs when the model goes to a sell signal right yeah that's my preference uh, I I'm uh, very comfortable with uh, the rhythm of the model in relation to its sell signals and therefore uh, chosen ETFs. <clears throat> right. So somebody's asking, uh, you generally stay short for a few days to a few weeks. Uh, for the most part, it depends on the environment. I remember in 2000, uh, 2001 actually, I went short, started going short in late July, early August, and I stayed short for several weeks. And back then, I was short stocks like uh, Qualcomm, Checkpoint, uh, Microsoft. Had like 500,000 shares short of Microsoft, I remember. Um, and it just kept going down. Uh, Broadcom was another one. And a lot of those stocks, you know, they had already broken down. And I'll just give you an example. Um, if you want to go back to cancel that, let's go to this is a weekly chart here. Yeah, let's look at, um, I'll just show you Broadcom back then. Uh, what happened since we are talking about the short side of the market but that was in 2001 so we'll go all the way back my weekly chart and this is the break that I got you know the stock was actually trading uh, it had already broken down severely and I remember I was shorting on this second rally up in here I was shorting as it was breaking the 50 day again because I figured it was going to retest the level which it did and just getting this move alone uh, was uh, big, uh, big profits. But I had actually been shorting some of these from here and got some of that that year. I was up 170 something percent that year in my own account, 2001 shorting. And a lot of that came from these breaks here. But even I remember at the very end, I had covered these and I was putting shorts out. And so I stayed short for several weeks playing that out. Uh, I think Microsoft also had a decent break back then. But it really depends on the environment. And here you can see Microsoft. Uh, this is the break that was uh, playable and again it was coming back down through the 10 week or the 50 day moving average here and that was playable and I've always hated Microsoft you know I always wonder why is it that they go after the oil companies for supposedly excess profits when if you look at any oil company they've got seven eight maybe nine percent profit margins uh, but yet you know we buy so much gas obviously when prices are where they've been for 450 I think we hit a gallon here, hey doctor, hey, what's uh, gas like in uh, or petrol like in uh, in London? Isn't it like nine dollars, ten dollars a gallon? Yeah, in general, uh, the UK and Europe has always been uh, uh, at least a couple hundred percent higher than uh, what they charge in the US. US yeah. petrol has always been a bargain basement compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, so if you want to think, if you ever want want to get tired or you get tired of four dollar and fifty cent gas, uh, a gallon of gas, go to London for a little while. And when you get home, you'll feel a lot better. Trust me. Uh, but in any case, you know, Microsoft still got 30% plus after-tax margins, and, and they they force us to use all their lousy products. Uh, I mean, think about it. Microsoft came out with the Zoom, tried to compete with the I, iPod. Nothing happened there. Microsoft hasn't come out with any kind of a phone. You see them uh, trying to team up with other people, but there's nothing going on there. Uh, so I think you know the government should come in and tax them excess profit tax on the basis uh, that that's what they try to do to the oil companies and the oil companies only make seven or eight or nine percent profit margin. It's kind of ridiculous but you know it all just kind of stems from the old stereotype of the evil oil man who's you know out to take everybody out. If there's anybody out there in the oil business you know what I'm talking about. It's a tough business, uh, a lot of risk uh, and a huge huge capital costs. Anyways Back then, I shorted Microsoft, and I was very happy to do so because I hate their products. I still do, but yet, look at me. I'm using a PC here with uh, Windows 7 or Windows XP. Um, so that's basically how I play that. And yeah, we do. Uh, I do. I can be very active on the short side. Um, 
you got to keep moving fast and generally taking a short-term view. Uh, yes, lately some of the metals, uh, somebody asking about some of the metals, steels have shown some movement upward. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Like for two days, I think. Uh, these look like dogs to me. These, these things have come down a fair bit. Um, I don't think, you know, there's really nothing to think here. Um, somebody's asking about Avago Technologies. It's holding up. You like the stock, Dr. K? Not with this big break, do you? It's just, uh, no, no, that's just sloppy. That's, there's too much sloppy volatility. Pattern. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, some people want some VOSI t-shirts. Um, you know, I don't think we really, we were looking into uh, getting a third party vendor, somebody to uh, mail out t-shirts so we can put them up for order, but it looks like we'd have to do it ourselves and, you know, I'm sorry, but I just don't feel like sitting in the office all day mailing t-shirts out to people. I have a lot of other things to do. Um, when you do, when you see the 50-day moving average drop below the 200-day moving average, a lot of times that is a very bearish sign. So, you know, I was pointing out earlier on Finisar, uh, you know, you had the 50-day crossover here, and that's actually when the stock broke down. If you look at LBS, uh, you're just getting the 50-day crossing over here recently, uh, just starting to. Uh, seen as I'm trying to think of some other examples of stocks that have broken down like that. Uh, Tzu has not its way above, but if you go, there are past examples where you uh, see that. I'm looking at F5, and I can keep an eye on this one uh, because you already have crossed below the 200-day moving average. Both the 50-day now and the 200-day are turning up, but this thing broke out. This is a pocket pivot, but it didn't really hold. And what I'd be watching for here is. Uh, Here's a, here's a little trend line breakout, okay? So here's your pocket pivot and your breakout. Now it's kind of failed that and got a little support near the 50-day moving average. This is still potentially a uh, head and shoulders type of formation. Because here's your left shoulder, here's your head. Remember the big volume break is right side of your head and then you have a series of shoulders. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes these things will take several months to break down. So this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, I don't know if this would be short, but let's say tomorrow the market runs into some trouble and this thing isn't going anywhere. Maybe this could be shortable using either this line here, today's high, as a, a co uh, cover point uh, to test out a short. But I do notice that that is one stock that is in a head and shoulders type of formation. And when we look at F5 on a big, uh, nice big fat weekly chart, let's blow that up a bit. You can see the pattern here. Um, and as you're coming up the right side here, you're not really getting any buying volume. So this is pretty weak. And one of the things I will watch for is if you do assume that this is a left shoulder here, this is your head. Remember, there's a big volume break that defines the right side of the head. And here's a right shoulder. Now, these are forming. Here's another right shoulder. It's forming below uh, this left shoulder here and also below here. So you've got some congestion up here, and maybe the 200-day continues to serve as uh, Resistance. Maybe it's a short on a rally back up there on weak volume. But for now, I'm kind of watching this as failing here at the 50-day moving average. At which point, it might be shortable on the basis of being a head and shoulders with several right shoulders. Um, I think you just got to keep an eye on this one. And what I notice here is you don't have a lot of big uh, upside volume. But notice last week here, you picked up volume. This is a heavier volume. Now, I'd watch this week and see how this pans out. Maybe it does break the 50-day, or maybe you get light volume. But one of the things you'll note uh, in head and shoulders formations is as you get through the right side of the formation on the right shoulders, a lot of times you'll start to see the volume on the upside get real weak, and it'll start to diminish. And so it's just showing you that demand on the right side of the formation is starting to, to wane. And you see a lot of selling in the pattern here, which tends to argue for the fact that it's going to roll over. and uh, as I see it, you have one wave down, two waves down. You could potentially have a third wave to the downside in this pattern. Or if the, the market writes itself and heads higher, maybe it, break, it tries to form a new base and breaks out. So you won't really know until it forms out. But right now, based on the fact that um, this pocket pivot has failed, really, uh, and if you call this a little flag trend line breakout, it's also failed. Uh, this could end up breaking. So I'm kind of watching this, and if it rallies or is not able to get too far from here, 
it may be short will hear rolling over again. So I would keep an eye on that one, okay? Uh, let's see here. People are asking about the site. I would, if you have any, uh, questions about where we're going with the site, um, it, I would just mail those, in, uh, email those in to subscriber at uh, virtueofselfishinvesting.com. That's the right email address, right, Dr. K? Uh, say that one more time. What's the email address for general questions? You know, there's so many. We have so many channels now. I'm, I'm actually not info, sure. We just info, all streamlined uh, to Gmail. So <laughs> yeah, you'll see it. You'll, yeah, you'll see them. Uh, It'll just be on obvious. Website. Yeah, yeah but there's, there's quite a few uh, of these of these ones, and I don't even know which goes where. I just have them all lump summed into uh, one account. <clears throat> yeah. So you've seen the site de develop and evolve. It'll continue to develop and evolve over time uh, as we find out what works and uh, what people. Uh, find useful, what they find useless. Uh, for the most part though, I think most things people find useful, hopefully. If not, let us know. Otherwise everybody would be canceling and it just seems like we keep getting more subscribers all the time. Uh, a couple of things. Let's just go through uh, somebody asking about the VIX. The VIX is still pretty low, so interestingly with the market breaking so hard over the past nine days, uh, the VIX really didn't get up there very much, so obviously not a lot of fear. Uh, in, a, in a way, you, you know, the sell-off has – everybody, I think, is thinking QE3 is going to come online, and so there's been a fair bit of complacency. That's why we tend to think – and Dr. K, chime in if you disagree – we tend to think that you're going to uh, probably roll over here on this rally and test the lows one more time at least. Uh, and break through the tune today, but we won't know that until we see it. That's why uh, we're just going to lay back here and let the market rally. But it is interesting to notice that even with nine days of a pretty hairy sell-off, if you think about it, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, show the Nasdaq one more time. You know, that's a pretty hairy break, and yet we don't really see any pickup in the VIX. Uh, I think back in March. You know, when the market came off uh, back in March of, uh, whoops, let's go, oh, where did that guy go? Where is he? I've lost my chart. He's in there somewhere. There he is. Yeah, back in March when the market broke down uh, pretty hard, you know, here, let's go back here. Uh, if you look at this, let's kind of line these up, see if I can get them to line up properly. Uh, but you'll notice that the VIX... Yeah, that's close enough. You see when the market broke down in March, okay, you can see the VIX jacked to the upside. And it's interesting, when you get this break like this, you don't really get the VIX jacking to the upside. Dr. K, do you read anything into that? No, I'm not seeing anything. I mean, I looked at the VIX earlier today because someone was talking about how it broke above that moving average. But uh, no, I, I don't see anything there. I mean, so what? You know, yeah, I, I would say from my perspective, what it does tell you is that there's a fair bit of complacency on this this pullback. So maybe it means that we're going to rally for a couple of days and then roll over and go through the lows. But you don't really need to worry about the VIX. I think the VIX works better as just an indicator of extreme fear, where uh, you see uh, a bottom form when you get the VIX really spiking like that. So I would tend to use it that way. Although I do think it, it does show some signs of uh, complacency on the part of investors on this pullback. So anyways, last but not least, because everybody asks about it, MCP is dead money. It's been dead money for a while, actually. You, are, you know, once it's building a base, it's dead money. But you're pulling down deep in the space, two waves down in the pattern, bounce off the 200-day moving average. It's going to need a lot of time. But of course, that goes with the market. You know, most stocks aren't going to buck the market. Three out of four stocks are going to come down. When the market comes down, and so MCP coming off the way it has, you know, just to be expected, is one of the volatile leaders on the upside when everything was beautiful, and now you're just coming down. This is what it looks like on a daily chart. They priced a secondary offering of 10 million plus shares at uh, 51, and they also priced 200 million dollars worth of convertible bonds uh, that are convertible into stock, I believe, in 2016. So here you've come in deep, you know, two ways down. This is going to take more time. So I wouldn't be trying to play this. I was trying to pick it up off here as a good trade. 
made a few bucks, but once it kind of could not hold the 50-day or hold this pocket type move here, that thing was uh, basically out the window, and it's going to take some time. So, anyways, I think that's all we've got for now. Anything else, Dr. K? No, that's it. All right, and if I think I see anything, I, I felt that Monday morning was kind of important that we get uh, some messages out to you guys in terms of being alert to the fact that we're approaching the 200-day moving average. A lot of leading stocks had already broken down. I'll also give you a little bit of color on what we thought of the metals just to keep you up to date since that's been the only area where we've been bullish. And so we just wanted to keep you up to date. If that happens again and or I see something that I think uh, we need to get a message out to you guys which is alert you guys to something that we're seeing in the market, uh, I'll do that again. Now, and I know the technology is not perfect. We always get one or two people emailing saying they can't hear the sound or they can't see the video moving or whatever. I, I think in a lot of cases, it, it, as I said earlier, the issues with GoToWebinar or GoView.com are generally related to your own specific system and your bandwidth. So sometimes rebooting your computer and starting the whole process over again works for some people. I've never had a problem. Dr. K, you've never had a problem with them, right? Right, but it's, it's always a software issue uh, at the end of the day. So, I mean, everyone needs to make sure that they're using the latest versions of Flash or, or what, whatever the protocol is um, to maximize their odds on, on this GoView working since GoView itself, I think some components of GoView are also in beta. Yeah, the other thing that we do with the GoView uh, videos is that we do upload them to the site, I believe. Is that correct, Dr. K? That's right. Yeah, so you can go to the site and look at them directly without having to go through GoView because we will. It takes a little time after we do it, but if you don't get it to work for you, you can do it afterwards uh, when we do upload it. But that may take a few hours for us to do, sometimes even a day, depending on how busy. Uh, yeah, we ultimately, get with everything that we broadcast, whether it's through this format or GoView, should eventually get posted on on uh, Virtue Selfish Investing. Everything. Um, if you right. if you see something missing, do write us and let us know because it might have been an oversight. Um, yeah. Because I, I do believe that actually out of the last twelve broadcasts, there was one that was missing that I that I picked out uh, the other day. Um, right. But we want to make sure everything is available to uh, to members. Right. So anyway, so watch for any other uh, videos that we do, GoView videos, uh, real quick. If we see something pre-open, uh, you know, it's always a great way to start my day. Coffee and a video uh, for you guys. <laughs> Well, we don't have the coffee yet, but we have the video. You'll have to get your own coffee or tea. Uh, anyways, thanks for showing up, everybody. I think that's it for now. If you have any further questions, you know where to email us, and we'll talk to you guys next time, all right? Take care, everybody. So long.